What time is it? That is not a rhetorical question. I am back from vacation, and I'm very, very jet-lagged. This was my first time on an airplane since 2019, and it's weirdly comforting how little has changed. Airport security, still a pain. In-flight Wi-Fi, still terrible. And there's still not enough leg room in economy. I gotta make this podcast blow up so that I can afford business class. Anyway, we are back with new episodes every week for the foreseeable future, and today's guest is one of my favorite podcasters, Shima Oliai, formerly of Radiolab and Dolly Parton's America. She is working on some new shows, and I think she's going to be announcing at least one of them soon, so keep an eye on her, or an ear, whatever. As always, thank you to our amazing patrons on Patreon, with a special shout-out this week to our newest patron, Matthias. You are listening to the public feed of Follow Friday, which means Shima is going to tell you about four of her favorite people to follow online, and you can get a bonus fifth follow from Shima by supporting this podcast at patreon.com slash follow Friday. Please consider becoming a supporter You unlock the patron-exclusive feed, Follow Friday XL, no matter how much you pledge, starting at just $1 a month. Thank you to all of our patrons, and thanks to everyone who sent me such lovely messages after the one-year anniversary special. I also want to thank today's sponsor. Today's show is brought to you by Kelsys, which pairs startups with expertly assembled software development teams. They work with funded startups across multiple industries to help them get to market fast. Learn more and get in touch at kelsus.com. Every ad gets me one step closer to business class. All right, let's get to today's new episode with Shima Oliai. Today is a good day to meet some new friends. Everyone make a way. The show is a buffet of folks you should know. I'm Eric Johnson. Welcome to Follow Friday, the podcast about who you should follow online. Every week, I talk to creative people about who they follow and why. This is a guided tour to the best people on the internet, led by your favorite writers, podcasters, comedians, and more. If this is your first episode of the show, take a moment now and please follow or subscribe in your podcast app. Today on the show is Shima Oliai, the co-creator of the Peabody award-winning podcast Dolly Parton's America. She's also reported some amazing stories for Radiolab and Kerning Culture and more, and now she's working on two new series, according to her Twitter bio. You can find Shima on Twitter at Shima Oliai. That's S-H-I-M-A-O-L-I-A-E-E. Shima, welcome to Follow Friday. Thank you. Exciting. So glad to have you here. Well, something that we were talking about before the taping is how our media consumption habits have changed in the past two years. And you said that poetry has helped you a lot. So I want to hear about this. Before we get into your follows, how has poetry been important to you recently? It's interesting because, well, some of it is from books, but a lot of it is also from online, like online accounts help remind you to read more poetry. Yeah. One of them, for the first series that I'm working on, I'm actually looking at some translations of old poems. And I think poetry just slows things down. And, you know, we live in New York. It's it's like, or I I do. And um, I can go nonstop all the time. I speak naturally very quickly. And actually, it took me time to learn how to complete a sentence before starting the next one. Because my (laughs) brain, my brain goes to the next thought so quickly. And uh, it was actually through a lot of radio work, I could hear my mind bouncing and I could hear in my head the whole sentence, but I would have had already moved on. Right. And so I learned other people can't hear that part that happened in my brain. So I've kind of learned how to slow down. I think the pandemic, if, if nothing else, kind of forces you to savor the moment, like savor the coffee shop, savor, mm-hmm. savor using a cup in savor sitting down versus taking it out. And I think poetry just, it's its almost musical. I read a lot of poems when I was much younger. 
I actually was a poet first. I thought oh. I thought I was going to be a songwriter. Yeah, wow. But then my songs were like R and B mixed with poetry, with like postmodern poetry, which doesn't sound good with an R and B. And I tried to somehow fuse it. It didn't work well. This is like you know teenage years. There's a lot of emo stuff too. I went into my emo poetry phase. Sure, I sure. loved poems. Oh my gosh, I was like, I loved poems because they were so visceral and emotional and. I'm so into that. And they're short. You get it out. You don't want to overthink it, right? And I'm an overthinker. So like poetry freed me. But a lot of it I would write, I would mimic other great poems. You know, as you're learning as a young person, that's what you do. But I hadn't read the great poets in quite a bit because I'm always reading texts. And by text, I mean, I, I also mean cell text, but, I, but you know, nonfiction work is a huge part of my job. And then you want to read a novel if you want to escape. Poetry is not like not the first thing, but I've been reading ancient Middle Eastern poetry by women, but I've also been reading modern poetry. I've been going back to my poetry books. It's wild that like for millennia, we've been writing poems that let people escape and think about their world and take a break, as you've been saying. That's so important. And maybe some of your follow recommendations will encourage us to do the same. So let's find out who Shima Oliai follows online. You can follow along with us today. Every person she recommends will be linked in the show notes and in the transcript at followfridaypodcast.com. It's Follow Friday. So Shima, before the show, I gave you a list of categories and I asked you to tell me four people you follow who fit in those categories. Your first pick is in the category, someone you just started following, and you said Dr. Nina Ansari, who is on Instagram and Facebook at Nina Ansari, and on Twitter at Dr. Nina Ansari. And her last name is spelled A-N-S-A-R-Y. So Nina is an author, she's a historian, and she's the director of the Global Women's Lecture Series at the World Affairs Council of America. Um, Do you remember, how did you start following her? <laughs> yes. So I was trying to get a hold of this human rights journalist for a story I was reporting, and I could not reach this person for months. And finally, this past winter, I got a hold of her. The same day she was going to be seeing another person I had also been trying to reach who doesn't live in New York. And they were going to meet that night. And then they were going to this secret event that was, you know, private. That was Nina Ansari's event. And so I got invited. I I actually did not have a spot (laughs) at the event. So what Nina did, Nina had not met me. She had didn't know who I was. But I think this human rights journalist kind of explained what I was uh, seeking. Mm -hmm. So she told the people that ran the event that I was her cousin. (laughs) 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 <laughs> visiting and I had surprised her and like, can there be one extra seat for her cousin? Right. So I didn't know any of this when I got there, but then I was like introduced as a cousin, but I had my audio equipment with me. So I had my headphones and a microphone and you were not allowed to record anything. Mm. <laughs> it's like, so I get there and then there's like, I get a lot of looks. I don't know what's, you know, I'm like, Oh, is it okay? And what really helps is acting like you don't know what's going on. And I recorded the event and she was the main speaker at this event. It was a human rights event. And afterward, I think she found me online. Mm. She found me and then I followed her. And then I started finding out more and more. That evening, I found out a lot about her too. But she's kind of like Batman. Okay. Not where I I expected that sentence to end. (laughs) She's kind of like... so. When I moved, like my dream was always to live in New York and I didn't move here as a kid, right? So it took me time, you know, I'm from Nevada. But I realized once I got here that a lot of my images of New York are based on Gotham City. Hmm. And a lot of my happiest memories about New York are either about Batman, especially Batman Returns, (laughs) the Tim Burton one, right? or um, anyone with Michael Keaton is great. Um, And also Home Alone 2. So there's like these kind of like very young ideas of New York that don't tell you how it smells or anything like that. They just look really pretty, you know, so. um, Both Christmas movies, I think. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Um, I, I was reminded of them this past Christmas. But when I finally felt like I made it, I don't know what that means, but like, I felt like I made it in New York. Like I had my own apartment and whatever. I felt very much like Bruce Wayne. Yeah. I felt like, wow, this is, 
<laughs> I'm do- and I'm a journalist. I'm like, I'm doing, you know, the justice work that no one can <laughs> right. do because everything is so corrupt. And so I felt that way. I felt very uh, like akin to that dream. But when I met Nina, who wears all black, <laughs> she only wears black. Like, I know I'm wearing black right now. <laughs> and also wearing some yellow and whatever. But um, she only wears black, nothing else. She no only wears black. She yeah. It was actually pointed out at one point in the evening. But um, she only wears black. And she secretly, I guess not that secretly anymore because I'm saying it, but she secretly funds many journalists doing justice work, Hmm. like really writing about the wrongs happening, especially in places that are underreported and Mm -hmm. in places that are being reported in a certain way that need more contextualization from those people from those places, not just the Western media view. Right. And so- she is Bruce Wayne. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> you know, if we were to go to a ball, she'd be the one putting it on. And everyone there who's doing good work, she's helping them. And she also, you can tell that she's very strong and tough, mm-hmm. even though she's um, very beautiful, warm. But you can tell that she's been, for the work she's done, she has been attacked. Yeah. Like, it's not easy to do what she's doing. Um, she doesn't ask for a lot of credit. Like a lot of people that we know do things like this. They're very famous. She's not. And she, she's su- such a champion of other people. She actually secretly helps run this other online handle that highlights people doing great work. She's constantly highlighting other people's great work, but she's doing great work and she's a champion of women. She read, uh, she wrote this book called Jewels of Allah. Which I was going to ask all, about this. Yeah. Yeah. All of these like kick ass women feminist fighters in Iran. And then she also wrote Anonymous as a Woman, which starts with this incredible statistic, which is that in all of recorded history. So this is something, I think this is a, um, a study that she helped fund mm-hmm. in all of recorded history, only 1.7% of that, which is recorded involves women. Wow. So think about it. Women are 50% of the population. So as of 2022, 1.7% is about women. So it's, I don't know. It's just like, she's just great. It's it's both a combination of who gets the opportunity to do things that are considered historically noteworthy to begin with, but then also who's doing the writing, who's doing the, 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 who's making the cuts as to what gets recorded, what gets preserved as as significant for future generations. She's constantly finding people that women, especially that people don't know and putting a spotlight on them. Right. That's what her research is about. That's so many women and women worldwide, too. She doesn't just keep it in the Middle East. She looks at the entire globe, especially in anonymous. I think her other book, other than Jules of Allah, is about a global gender inequality, just the state of where things are, which I I imagine that book must be 3000 pages long, but (laughs) (laughs) it's not that it's not that long. I did read it, but it's not that. Yeah. Um, not 3000, but it's, it's, she, she had to go through and select, but there was so much, Yeah. but that hadn't been reported on. Um, and she also values, like everyone on this list, there's a little bit of spice in the rice. Like yeah. she did this one, like, so it, I feel like I've given you a very clear image of this person, but then there's a chapter right before she goes into highlighting these global, uh, women kind of heroes. She has a chapter about yin and yang and like kind of the philosophy of like, male and female and how that has been transmuted over time, how that has been manipulated for certain eras. And I thought that was so like, so interesting. Like who would do that? The, uh, a lot of people that I, like academics, I like, they, they throw in something that I feel like the academic world would be like, why would you do that? You know, but I, I, it was just a surprise right before I got to the first name that she mentioned. Yeah, so, so she's gently breaking some of the norms, some of the conventions as one of the many ways that she's advocating for better representation for, for women and, and for opportunities, things, things like that. Is, yeah, her is there, style. Yeah. Her style embodies her mission. Yeah. As she's achieving her mission. She's not, she's not using the style of the people that only wrote 1.7% of women into history, you know? Exactly. That's exactly it. Well, that was Dr. Nina Ansari, who is on Twitter at Dr. Nina Ansari. It's Final Friday. Shima, let's move on to your next follow. I asked you for someone super talented who's still under the radar, and you said Ingrid Rojas Contreras, who is on Twitter at Ingrid underscore Rojas underscore C. 
and on Instagram at I underscore underscore Rojas Contreras. Ingrid is the author of the best-selling novel Fruit of the Drunken Tree, and she has a memoir due out in July called The Man Who Could Move Clouds. Uh, what was your introduction to her work? Were you a fan of her first uh, her first novel? No. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my intro to her. I'm not saying, yeah. no, the novel is great. The novel yeah, yeah. is great. Oh, my God. Okay, um, you know her in real life. Is, is the oh, my gosh, yeah. yeah. So I actually met her on pop-up tour. So I was going oh. around the country with her in the fall, you know, get, we we each uh, shared a 10 minute kind of talk. This is for Pop Up Magazine, which is, you may want to explain for folks who, who haven't had the chance to see it. Yeah, it's kind of a multimedia show where they take artists, journalists, writers, and you present a piece. And there's, you know, usually an animation and music. It's like a live performance of a written essay piece, like something you'd read maybe in The New Yorker. Right. That's that's kind of the idea of it. A multimedia magazine. Yeah. And so I met her on tour. There were three women on tour, me, Ingrid and Chanel Miller. So we became very close. And Ingrid and I were the only two on every date of the tour together. So um, I got to know her <laughs> really close. We, we were just like calling each other best friend the first day. I think I started it. <laughs> And she went along. (laughs) She's like a mythic figure herself. So she wears this like eyeliner that's like a cat eye. And she has this bob haircut. She looks like an image in a film. (laughs) And she's literally survived a revolution in Colombia, has this epic life that she has gone through. Her family story is incredible. That's what she shared a bit about in her pop-up piece, which you can read in her memoir, which I think her memoir is going to be huge this next year. Yeah, She's one of those writers. So her presentation happened after mine. So I would give mine. And then the first time I saw it, I saw it in the audience about halfway through. And then every night after that, I would just watch. And then I started <laughs> performing it for her. So there's this moment. <laughs> oh my God. It's so funny. So by the third show... You know, we'd be hanging out and, you know, we would joke about everything. We we were very sleep deprived, too, because we, you know, we were having fun, but also like working. And there's this moment where she talks about Nona, who's her mother, mm-hmm. who would do exorcisms <laughs> as part of her work. And so she would sit with people and she and basically there's this line where she says, Nona was a lazy exorcist because she would just take a <laughs> cup of water, put it on a table and she would say these lines. She would say. Look, you don't want to be here to the ghost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. But uh, <laughs> I need the money. Right. So we, what are we going to do? So that kind of line, I would, I started saying it to Ingrid, like, because I loved it. And I would quote her piece back to her. Yeah. By the time we got to DC, which was the last show, she was doing the piece like she was me doing the piece like <laughs> she was because she's she's a writer like she's a serious very thoughtful intelligent right. human I'm a little bit more I'm a little bit more hammy and <laughs> so a little bit my background in comedy and everything and so I saw the last show I was like Ingrid you were doing me doing you and she goes yeah it worked really <laughs> that's just, a copy of a copy yeah <laughs> she got really because she also could because of the way I would uh, quote the lines, she knew which lines to like really sink into. Um, but I was just a fan. I like instantly became a fan. Her writing is such that I love this when I hear this in an artist. As a musician, I also have a music background. There's sometimes you'd hear a musician play live and they'd be so good that it would actually be discouraging. <laughs> so you would just like... And this was a common phenomenon. My musician friends and I would talk about it. Like some people were so good that it would kind of be sad at the end. But some people were so good, but they you still felt hopeful. Like you felt like I can do it. I'm not them, but I can do something. You know, Ingrid's writing is like that. Is when you hear her writing, you start thinking, oh, I have a story. And I love that. I feel like that's something in her soul that's being transmitted through her work. I think her generous like heart is like being transmitted. So when you hear it, you're like, oh, I can, my family's so interesting to, oh, wow, this is, oh, it's so weird how things mirror and repeat in family generations and all of that. And her writing is, you know, very magical, real, has a lot of magical realism in it. And it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Even as she's writing a memoir, it's just, yeah, it's beautiful. There's this other piece 
she wrote that was about self mesmerism. Mm. And it was, it, she was talking about her trauma from having survived a revolution yeah. and how it was hard for her to write because when she, she says, when you write, you have to sit down for 10 minutes. Yeah. But if you've been through trauma, you have to get up every, like, you got to check the door. You got to do this. You got to do that. And so she learned how to kind of, it was almost like, it's not hypnotism, but she would self mesmerize herself. I love that she kind of pieced together this beautiful essay about how to get into that writing space. So she's like also helpful as a fellow writer. And then I think she, I don't know where she posted this. I tried to find it before I got online with you. She had this picture, I don't know where I saw it online, of a bathtub and a plank between two sides of the bathtub. Mm -hmm. Did you see this when you when you looked? No, up? no, I didn't see this. And she put her typewriter on the plank in the bathtub with water. And I asked her, do you write? Is that like a, are you actually right? That's an artistic photo, right? She goes, oh, no, no, I was writing That's in the tub. Works. Whoa. That's, oh my gosh, it's so good. Do it every day. I do it every day right now. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just, she's just fun. Every stop that we had, you know, everyone had friends in every city. Sure. Everyone she knew was a, a young novelist, poet. Like I felt like I was meeting the who's who of the next generation of American writers. And I love that. She was so much fun. I got to, da we danced so much. I think I danced more. I was a little bit, I had, I had a good time the last, the DC night. I'm um, so glad. But yeah. I had so much fun. We made friends with 20 year olds that weren't supposed to be at the club we were at. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it was the last night of the tour, so it was good. But um, yeah, I think that, I love that. I love her writing. I, she has something that's about to come out that I think is going to be great. And also she feels like a friendly writer. Like she feels like a, a friend to other writers. She oh, is a so friend good. to other writers, but her yeah. work also transmits that. That's that's so good. I mean, that, that's something where like, um, even just talking about one's creative process is not a given. It's not something you can always expect from someone who's at this point in their career where they're, they're a rising star, you know, writer. Um, and I found this uh, quote, this is something she wrote in Catapult magazine that I just absolutely adored. Um, maybe this was the same essay that you, you saw before. I'm not sure. Uh, she's talking about her creative process and she says, I began to describe myself as a free diver afloat in the ocean, flanked on all sides by nothing but a sea horizon. The landscape was beautiful, cerulean and deadly. Divers have to increase their lung capacity in order to free dive, packing their lungs with air so they can descend as deeply as possible for as long as possible. So every day after, as I sat down to write, I imagined myself taking in breath enough to last me for hours. Then I'd dive as deep as I could go. Every day I aimed for somewhere deeper. Like, I, I just feel like that's like such a, it, it like really unlocks, as someone who's never attempted to write a novel, right, or anything like that that just unlocks so much in a very, in just a one paragraph, basically, of just like how this, you know, uh, this uh, incredibly talented person is thinking about digging up their own experience, their, their own life, and, and, and finding ways to turn that in, into art. I, I love that. This is probably silly, but if Nina is Batman, she's Aquawoman. <laughs> she's very, you know, she's of right the water. Right from the tub, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's so great. That was Ingrid Rojas Contreras, who is on Twitter at Ingrid underscore Rojas underscore C. We're going to take a quick break now, but we'll be back in a minute with Shima Oliai. Today's show is brought to you by Kelsis, a fully invested technical partner for your business. Kelsis works with funded startups across a variety of industries, providing them with an expert team of software developers to help them get to market fast. They have experience working with dozens of companies, helping them build products that can compete, thrive, and exit. Visit kelsus.com, that's K-E-L-S-U-S dot com to learn more and give them a call to meet your new technical co-founder. That's kelsus.com. It's Final Friday. Welcome back to Follow Friday. Shima, I asked you to tell me about someone who makes you laugh, and you said he also makes you think, and that's the writer Kiese Lehman, who is on Twitter and Instagram at Kiese Lehman. His name is spelled K-I-E-S-E-L-A-Y-M-O-N. Um, I knew that I was going to like Kiese right away when I saw his pinned tweet, which is, quote, Every day of my adult life, I've asked myself, did these motherfuckers not watch Sesame Street? <laughs> 
<laughs> so oh uh, I'm immediately sold. But why don't you talk about why you follow him? Oh my gosh, Kise is like oh, this is so silly. Oh my god, I'm using way too many metaphors for these people. <laughs> I, this might be pandemic brain. I don't know. It's yeah. just you know, um, nothing is real. So. <laughs> Um, he's like my fairy godmother of the pandemic. I met him at the start of 2020. I was looking for my next series after Dolly Parton's America. And I thought I was going to do a deep dive of the new South, um, starting with Mississippi. And it's because I found all of these stories, most of which I couldn't even use in the Dolly series. I mean, I shoved as many as I could, but I still had so much other material and I had also discovered new kind of rabbit holes to dive down, especially Mississippi was one that we couldn't really take on because we were focusing on Tennessee with Dolly. And the first book I read in 2020 was Kiese Lehman's Heavy, which is such a good book. Like I bought it for my boss at that time. And I was like, you should read this. And I had, I'd already just started it. But by the time I got midway through the book, I thought to myself, this is the best gift he has ever received. <laughs> right, talk, yeah, talk about what he what he write, writes about in there. I read a little bit, a blurb about it, but it sounds fascinating. Yeah, he writes, so it, he's doing many things. He writes kind of like a poet, he's a poet. He, I don't know if he would say that that's what he was doing. I'm, I Actually, I kind of think that maybe he would, but he's very poetic in how he writes. Right. He uses a tool where he's writing a letter to his mother as he's writing the memoir. And I don't know if I want to ruin it for people who haven't read it yet, but... The way he depicts childhood trauma, especially sexual trauma, is unlike anything I'd ever read. And he is a phenomenal writer. Also, his life itself, he's someone who who walks the walk. So, for instance, he's talking a lot about revision. Revision is, you know, one of his works. And he tweets a lot and I'll like a tweet and then it's just gone. I'll retweet it and I'll notice, oh, it's this tweet is gone and he'll have deleted it. And I finally just asked him, I was like, where do all your tweets go? Like, what do you get in trouble? What is going on? And he goes, no, I just like to revise. And, And so when he goes and then at one point he actually explained it online. He goes, look, when I'm on Facebook, I can edit. So I'll write something and then I'll go back and edit it. But in on Twitter, you can't do that. So I just delete it. And like, he's literally living his work as he's tweeting. <laughs> so um, there, there's another kind of fun aspect of him. He just, I worked with him on The Flag and the Fury, which mm-hmm. was kind of a deep dive reporting international phenomenon that was supposed to just be about Mississippi at really the height of the terror of the pandemic. Like we didn't quite know what was happening and the most people were hospitalized and he was the person I was most on the phone with besides, you know, some senators from Mississippi and Lauren Stennis, who also went to Millsaps with him. So he became my kind of work community yeah. during that year, um, during that reporting. And then I asked him to help me report out Harry Pace, the Harry, the Vanishing of Harry Pace series. I really wanted his opinion before I actually brought the series or the story to anyone. I called him first And I said, what do you think about the story? And I walked him through the story. (laughs) I still have the audio of that. I don't think it's in, it didn't make the series because, you know, we tell the story in the series, but he was like, oh, shit. Oh, Oh, now you're (laughs) going to beat me a lot. Like, oh, oh, wait, wait, what? Oh, wait, what? And then by this point, we'd actually kind of, we'd become friends. So I would also, we would like, we would be talking about life and like what was, what was going on with him and him and and me and whatever. And then I'd go back to the story and they were like, oh, oh, oh. And then we'd go back to something else. And then I was like, oh, wait, there's more. And so it's like, the tape is so crazy. But, and then at the end I said, can I, can we do the story? He's like, Shima, you got to do the story. You have to do. <laughs> Thank you. Like, so, like, so he gave me confidence to like push because it's very scary. It's about race in America during 2020 and 2021. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted to look at, at some of the the gray matter or the gray line mm-hmm. in between black and white that I don't think was being talked a lot about at that moment. Right now it, with passing and all of these, uh, there's a ton of work coming out that looks kind of at the middle ground or other also, you know, even within the Asian community coming out about their own experiences with racism during the pandemic. Like, I think a lot of people that feel lost in between 
these two kind of binary worlds are sharing their story. And a lot of people are part of both those worlds, too, that feel the same way, lost in their identity in America. But you mentioned that, that Kese uh, also makes you laugh. I mean, it sounds I mean, we've had a close working relationship with him. Um, but are, are you, do you also find like anything in his writing? Is, is there stuff that you'd recommend that or, or his social media posting that, that really makes you laugh? Everything. Sometimes <laughs> everything he tweets about sports is just funny to me because mm. like he's so part of like this punk rock movement. Like I feel like Kese is the future. I just feel like when I'm confused, I want to be more in line with whatever he's doing. It feels, <laughs> I don't know. He would probably totally disagree with me and say, Shima, don't do that. Please don't stop. You know, like it's dangerous, you know, but I like how he lives and he's just funny. Okay. For instance, I interviewed him, you know, for the Harry Pay series. I interviewed him so many times, but one of the conversations we had was about Du Bois. <laughs> it was about what? <laughs> it was about W.E.B. Du Bois. Right? Ah. So another book came out with his name in the title last year that was like top seller. I think it was called Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. So that, that was the book title of the book that came out last year about Du Bois, right? Mm -hmm. So or Du Bois adjacent. So when you bring up Du Bois, you think I had actually interviewed Imani Perry about him. And anyone you interview about Du Bois is like totally full of respect and awe and <laughs> I asked him about um, the talented 10th. Like, what do you think about this talented 10th idea? Da, da, da. And he's like, Shima, you know what he, you know what happened is he was like talented 10th. <laughs> 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 Fell in love with the alliteration. <laughs> yes. He's like, that shit sounds good. You know, that shit sounds really good. You know, like, and he's like, I think it just sounded good. I think, and it, like, he almost recast him as a hip hop artist. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay. And it was just funny. I I laughed so hard my laptop shut down. <laughs> just like it was I, like the whole thing, and then it literally in the tape you hear oh shit because he sees like the whole assembly I have in my in my kitchen <laughs> at that time right. had just totally broken down. But that's that's him. Is his perspective is just so unique, mm -hmm. and it's you don't see it coming when it's coming, and <laughs> I mean he got kicked out of Millsaps College for borrowing a library book without checking it out. And he had, he had like fought a fraternity for dressing in blackface and that didn't get him kicked out, but borrowing the book got him kicked out. Wow. And then, you know, Oberlin called and he said, look, I, you know, he didn't know what he was gonna do. Mm -hmm. And Oberlin said, you're exactly the kind of student we're looking for. So there's something kind of, you know, kind of classical comedian about that is that, even you blunder, you fall. He always, he wins, at least in my perspective, you know, the, I, as an audience member, as like, and as a fan, you right. know, so I think that that's, I really appreciate that. And he just thinks it's funny. Nothing I tell him will ever phase him. <laughs> and he always surprises me whenever I get on the phone with him. He always surprises me. And he's so honest. You know, as a journalist, if I'm calling someone, they don't want to really tell you what they think. Mm. He's really open. I'm like that too. To a fault. Like, I'm a little bit too open. He, <laughs> and so is he. And I really appreciate that. I wish everyone were more like that. I think the world would the change much more quickly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was Kiese Lehman, who is on Twitter and Instagram at Kiese Lehman. It's Final Friday. We have time for one more follow today. I asked you for someone who makes the internet a better place, and you said Roxanne Gay, who is on Twitter at R-G-A-Y, and who also writes a newsletter called The Audacity at audacity.substack.com. Roxanne is one of my favorite Twitter followers, too, and yeah. I think I first heard her on an episode of This American Life called Tell Me I'm Fat. Um, do you remember how you first came across Roxanne or her work? I'm sure it was through Bad Feminist, the essay. Yeah. So one of my fantasies during the Dolly Pardon project was for Dolly and Roxanne to sit in a room and Ooh. talk about feminism. I think they would actually really love each other. I mean, everyone yeah. loves, I, I mean, I love both of them. So I think it would just, yeah. Anyway. But explain for people who don't know, who don't know Roxanne, like why would that have been such a good pairing? I can kind of imagine it just from how, from following Roxanne's work, but uh, what, 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 would, what would have been? One of the, like the first episode in the Dolly series looks at feminism and at the fact that Dolly told us in an interview that 
she does not consider herself a feminist, but she is a feminist icon <laughs> in America. So we were kind of wrapping our heads around why is that and why won't she just take on the term mm -hmm. and kind of looking at feminism in American history. And bad feminist is kind of what I think Dolly would call herself. She's like, I'm a bad feminist. I got big boobs, <laughs> I got a, like fake hair, <laughs> whatever, but I'm real inside. Like that's Roxanne. She's just like feels so real, though I've never met her. She feels like such a benevolent force. Like in any aspect that you encounter her, mm -hmm. she's always interesting. She has a wide array of taste. Her taste is excellent. When I get her newsletter, I almost pat myself on the back when I'm like, that's what I thought. Oh, I love that essay too. And <laughs> like, I, I felt like, oh, the right things on Twitter this week I read, mm -hmm. I was attracted to reading because look, these are the things that she's bringing up. And then she also can just be so real. Like guys, I don't even know about this and just <laughs> sends you an essay. But she also highlights, she highlighted a Kenyan writer this past week. Um, she looks global. She just, she's, so I never would have written, read this blog mm -hmm. if Roxanne hadn't sent it. So I love that. I feel like, she talks back on the internet. I mean, women get attacked on the, especially if you are a feminist on the internet, but she's so good at responding without it ever feeling like it overtakes her. That's just from my perspective. She also seems to enjoy the internet, even though it can be such a bad place for so many people. Right. So Roxanne is one of the t talking heads or one of the interviewees of this documentary called 15 Minutes of Shame. And it was on, it came out on HBO Max this past year. But Roxanne talks about the start of Twitter, like how it was so groundbreaking that you could reach out to anyone, mm -hmm. how that had never happened before and how revolutionary that was. You could talk to them. They might respond to you. It was just so groundbreaking. And I think... I was not on Twitter at that time. I, I think I'm a bit younger than her too. So I think I was just, I just wasn't on Twitter. So I missed that aspect of all of this, but like hearing her talk about it was so interesting. Oh, there was a time where it wasn't like everyone was on. Right. So you could maybe find your way through the ether, though you can still kind of do that now, but the joy of the internet was still like alive in her. Like she could talk about that moment. And, but then she could also talk about the dark side at the flip end, right? Um, like if you, you know how you always want like a good friend in your corner when you're fighting a battle, mm -hmm. it feels like she's that person, you know, it feels like in the war of what's the culture and everything happening right now, it's good to have her voice somewhere. It would be such a loss not to have her voice. I love her newsletter, even with Wordle. That's <laughs> just like <laughs> she posts her Wordle results most no, days. No, no. Yeah, I just no, I didn't. I'm not even talking about that. She brought up Wordle in her newsletter last week. That yeah, I, and it was written in the New York Times, so it wasn't like she made the story up or she f necessarily reported it out. But she said, "Did you know Wordle was a love story?" Yeah. Like she just went to the thing that I actually cared about. I'm like, oh, that's so not. And then I played Wordle after I read the piece. Right. <laughs> because I felt like there was a deeper connection. I just, I just love how she sees, just like Kiese, um, and Ingrid and Nina, you mm -hmm. know, she really just. She identifies some element of the story and really, and really puts it, puts it, you know, gives it to the spotlight. She, she, she identified something about wordle that was not just this is a viral video game about words but here's like an interesting human you know aspect yeah. of the story of how it was made yeah and she has she has deep and traumatic pieces of writing in that newsletter but she also just makes fun of things happening in the pop, pop culture and she won't be cruel though i, yeah. I have found that she do, never errs on the side of cruelty. She's just, she'll just say, I don't know, guys. I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is the perfect way to deal with something that's really hard or just very confusing or just should not be a part of the culture, but is. I mean, I mean who, who are we to say what should be part of it or not? But just as bizarre, things that are bizarre, instead of skewering it, she'll just, she'll yeah. just shrug her shoulders and make a side comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's, what's something that um, you think the rest of us can do? to make the internet a better place in the same way that Roxanne does? What's something we can learn from her example? Tell the truth. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know. I, as soon as I say that, I don't even know if I want to, but I think that it's very scary. Yeah. Yeah, I think for a lot of people and 
And don't, I, I also want to say don't censor, but you know, right now that's, a, that's a big question, right? Yeah. First amendment rights. Um, who gets to say what and how, and it's, it's tough. And if you see someone under fire, reach out. I don't know. Yeah. But who under fire? It's like, so, <laughs> oh my God, I don't know. How do we make the internet better? I don't know. Take it away. Read books, read books. Yeah, read, yeah books. read books, read books. It'll help you be more compassionate when you enter yeah. the Internet sphere or Very whatever good. or the, the web. Yeah, I think actually I think that's actually a great thing. Read more. Get off Twitter for a little bit and read something longer than 280 characters. Yeah, <laughs> go, go deeper. Yeah. You know, the, I think that's a real travesty of our time. I read this book, uh, Deep Work, recently yeah. about how it's really hard to sit down. I, there's another book coming out about this, too. It's like kind of in the ether right now. Mm-hmm. A lot of academics or writers are looking at the fact that we don't sit down for two, three, four hours just to look at one thing Mm -hmm. in depth. It's really important, you know. Yeah, it it changes how you comport yourself everywhere, including on Twitter. It it has ripple effects. If you, if you, you can read Ingrid's thing about self mesmerism. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) to figure out how to do that. But yeah, uh, how, how, Eric? What do you think? Yeah, I I think. what you your first response tell the truth i think is actually a big part of what i like about roxanne as well as i feel like as you said she's not cruel she's not punching down on anyone but she's also directly engaging with the heart of what's if there's a problem she's acknowledging this is this is a thing that we should talk about like it's it's not I, i think it's it's very easy and understandable honestly for folks who want to just close their eyes and say like, or I don't want to look at that. I don't want to think about that. I, I totally understand intellectually why so many people would do that. But I don't think Roxanne does a lot of the time. I think she has, she's brave. Um, and yeah. and that, that's, I, I really admire that about her. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah, of course. Because the internet can feel so loud, especially when something is being debated, right? So for instance, Dave Chappelle's comedy special mm-hmm. was, deba- you know, and all of my comedy writer friends, everyone <laughs> was calling each other. You know, this is these are things that we talk about all the time, especially when you're from a marginalized community or you're not from yeah. a white straight. You're not part of the white straight cis male you know, culture and you're not seen that way. You know, who gets to say the joke? And it's almost like an unwritten rule, but, but it's not for everyone. Like I have, I have had comedy mentors who would kill me for saying this right now, but I do not think you should punch downward. Yeah. Like if someone has less rights than you, Mm -hmm. like comedians are there, they're the court jester, you know, and this is me like going into like, you and I, you were preaching to the choir here. This is, this is one of something I value that I hold very dear is if you have any sort of platform, if you have influence, power, Punching down is just like that's that's one of the um, things people that are, turns me off the most about any sort people of people are so scared to speak up. Like I'm always someone I'm a little bit foolish like that. Like I'll throw myself in front of the train. Mm-hmm. Like if anyone is hurting, I just like I can't even I don't even think about it. Right. But I think that that's where I get when someone's punching down or they don't even acknowledge that they're doing that. Yeah. Like they think that they're still on the bottom rung, though they are a wealthy, you know, happy person, you know, of privilege. Not saying that they don't have their own suffering. Everyone has suffering, by the way. Every human. Mm-hmm. That's why everyone can still tell a joke. Like yeah. everyone still has something that they can say. But I, I do think that that's so crucial. Yet I saw with what happened with Dave Chappelle, like everyone got so loud online. Mm-hmm. Right. And this is something that I really wrestled with on working and interviewing Dolly so many times over because, you know, and uh, you can hear it in the Dolitics episode, but I talked much more at length with her, but there is a moment at the very end of the episode where I ask, you know, sometimes when I don't speak up, other people get hurt. Right. And I asked her about that. And she said that she had a great sense of timing because she doesn't necessarily say, she said that she doesn't speak up. She doesn't get involved in politics, right? Mm. So my question to you is, this is my very long-winded way of saying, I'm asking you, um, saying things and asking you, how do you engage, like, as you, you as someone who observes people online and people that you think do it well and do it not so well, how do you engage in the noise without it devouring you and without you creating more 
problems, like without hurting more people on accident, you know, how do you do it? I, w- I wish I had an answer to that. I mean, uh, no, can we call Roxanne right now? Should we ask? Yeah, I, I wish that'd be great. You got a number? Let's, let's call her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, it's, it the, the, since there is no simple answer to that, what I, my philosophy on that is very imperfect, half baked notion is elevate the people who are uh, who who need who need the spotlight and try not to try not to elevate like the the, the common thing on Twitter. I'm a, I'm a Twitter addict. Is the quote tweet where you are quoting someone else saying something stupid, and the point of that is to say like, hey, look at this idiot saying something offensive, mm. saying something you know dumb about about whatever, and all that does, of course, is it amplifies. The toxic message it amplifies the the part of the conversation that should not be amplified, and so I, th- I think it's it's counter programming in a way is is maybe the it's it's not it's not it's not enough it's not everything but it's you know it, it counter programming with you know making sure that the people who are marginalized are the ones who are be, being you know amplified by you know if you're a person who has that influence that power is my best you know but anyway that was Roxanne Gay who is on Twitter at R G A Y. Shima, thank you for sharing all these follows with us today. Before we go, let's make sure listeners know how to find you online. Where do you want them to follow you? Um, I'm just my name. So it's S-H-I-M-A-O-L-I-A-E-E. It's a lot of vowels. So any, on Twitter or Instagram, same thing. Follow me on Twitter at HeyHeyESJ. And don't forget to follow or subscribe to Follow Friday in your podcast app. If you like this episode, then check out the past Follow Friday interviews with Avery Truffleman, Eric Malinsky, and Franklin Leonard. Follow Friday's theme music was written by me and performed by Yona Marie. Our show art was illustrated by Dodi Hermerwan. Special thanks to our Big Fry Patreon backers, John and Justin. Visit patreon.com slash follow Friday for bonus follows, behind the scenes updates, and more. That's all for this week. This is Eric Johnson reminding you to talk about people behind their backs. And when you do, say something nice. See you next Friday. Today's show was brought to you by the Lightning Pod email newsletter, which is where I share my thoughts on the podcasting industry, behind-the-scenes updates on Follow Friday, and links to all of the podcasts that I've been working on. It's free, it's interesting, and you can sign up at lightningpod.fm newsletter.